Chapters 16 through 17 of Irenaeus Against Heresies, Book 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Irenaeus Against Heresies, Book 2, translated by Alexander Roberts and William H. Rombo. Chapter 16 the creator of the world either produced of himself the images of things to be made or the pleroma was formed after the image of some previous system and so on ad infinitum one but if they will not yield assent to any one of these conclusions since in that case they would be proved by us as incapable of rendering any reason for such a production of their pleroma they will of necessity be shut up to this that they confess that, above the Pleroma, there was some other system, more spiritual and more powerful, after the image of which their Pleroma was formed. For if the Demiurge did not of himself construct that figure of creation which exists, but made it after the form of those things which are above, then from whom did their Bythus, who, to be sure, brought it about that the Pleroma should be possessed of a configuration of this kind, received the figure of those things which existed before himself. For it must needs be, either that the intention of creating dwelt in that God who made the world, so that of his own power, and from himself, he obtained the model of its formation, or if any departure is made from this being, then there will arise a necessity for constantly asking whence there came to that one who is above him the configuration of those things which have been made. What, too, was the number of the productions, and what the substance of the model itself? If, however, it was in the power of Bythus to impart of himself such a configuration to the Pleroma, then why may it not have been in the power of the Demiurge to form of himself such a world as exists? And then, again, if creation be an image of those things above, why should we not affirm that those are, in turn, images of others above them? and those above these again, of others, and thus go on supposing innumerable images of images. 2. This difficulty presented itself to Basilides after he had utterly missed the truth, and was conceiving that, by an infinite succession of those beings that were formed from one another, he might escape such perplexity when he had proclaimed that three hundred and sixty-five heavens were formed through succession and similitude by one another, and that a manifest proof of the existence of these was found in the number of the days of the year, as I stated before, and that above these there was a power which they also style unnameable, and its dispensation, he did not even in this way escape such perplexity. For when asked whence came the image of its configuration to that heaven which is above all, and from which he wishes the rest to be regarded as having been formed by means of succession, he will say, from that dispensation which belongs to the unnameable. He must then say, either that the unspeakable formed it of himself, or he will find it necessary to acknowledge that there is some other power above this being, from whom his unnameable one derived such vast numbers of configurations as do, according to him, exist. 3. How much safer and more accurate a course it is, then, to confess at once that which is true, that this God, the Creator, who formed the world, is the only God, and that there is no other God besides Him, He Himself receiving from Himself the model and figure of those things which have been made, than that, after wearying ourselves with such an impious and circuitous description, we should be compelled, at some point or another, to fix the mind on someone, 
and to confess that from him proceeded the configuration of things created. 4. As to the accusation brought against us by the followers of Valentinus, when they declare that we continue in that hebdomad which is below, as if we could not lift our minds on high, nor understand those things which are above, because we do not accept their monstrous assertions, this very charge do the followers of Basilides bring in turn against them, inasmuch as the Valentinians keep circling about those things which are below, going as far as the first and second Ogdoad, and because they unskillfully imagine that, immediately after the thirty Ions, they have discovered him who is above all things Father, not following out in their thought their investigations to that pleroma which is above the three hundred and sixty-five heavens which is above forty-five ogdoads and any one again might bring against them the same charge by imagining four thousand three hundred and eighty heavens or ions since the days of the year contain that number of hours if again someone adds also the nights, thus doubling the hours which have been mentioned, imagining that in this way he has discovered a great multitude of ogdoads, and a kind of innumerable company of ions, and thus, in opposition to him who is above all things father, conceiving himself more perfect than all others, he will bring the same charge against all, inasmuch as they are not capable of rising to the conception of such a multitude of heavens or ions as he has announced, but are either so deficient as to remain among those things which are below, or to continue in the intermediate space. Chapter 17. Inquiry into the production of the ions. Whatever its supposed nature, it is in every respect inconsistent and on the hypothesis of the heretics, even Naus and the father himself would be stained with ignorance. 1. That system, then, which has respect to their pleroma, and especially that part of it which refers to the primary Ogdoad, being thus burdened with so great contradictions and perplexities, let me now go on to examine the remainder of their scheme. In doing so, on account of their madness, I shall be making inquiry respecting things which have no real existence. Yet it is necessary to do this, since the treatment of this subject has been entrusted to me, and since I desire all men to come to the knowledge of the truth, as well as because thou thyself hast asked to receive from me full and complete means for overturning the views of these men. 2. I ask, then, in what manner were the rest of the Ions produced? Was it so as to be united with him who produced them, even as the solar rays are with the sun? Or was it actually and separately, so that each of them possessed an independent existence and his own special form, just as has a man from another man, or one herd of cattle from another? Or was it after the manner of germination as branches from a tree? And were they of the same substance with those who produced them? Or did they derive their substance from some other kind of substance? Also, were they produced at the same time, so as to be contemporaries? Or after a certain order, so that some of them were older and others younger? And again, are they uncompounded and uniform, and altogether equal and similar among themselves, as spirit and light are produced? Or are they compounded and different, unlike to each other in their members? 3. If each of them was produced, after the manner of men, actually and according to its own generation, then either those thus generated by the Father will be of the same substance with him, and similar to their author, or, if they appear dissimilar, then it must of necessity be acknowledged that they are formed of some different substance. 
Now, if the beings generated by the Father be similar to their author, then those who have been produced must remain for ever impassable, even as he who produced them. But if, on the other hand, they are of a different substance, which is capable of passion, and whence came this dissimilar substance to find a place within the incorruptible pleroma? Further, too, according to this principle, each one of them must be understood as being completely separated from every other, even as men are not mixed with, nor united the one to the other, but each having a distinct shape of his own and a definite sphere of action, while each one of them, too, is formed of a particular size, qualities characteristic of a body, and not of a spirit. Let them, therefore, no longer speak of the pleroma as being spiritual, or of themselves as spiritual, if indeed their ions sit feasting with the Father, just as if they were men and he himself is of such a configuration as those reveal him to be who were produced by him. 4. If, again, the ions were derived from Logos, Logos from Naus, and Naus from Bithus, just as lights are kindled from a light, as, for example, torches are from a torch, then they may no doubt differ in generation and size from one another. But since they are of the same substance with the author of their production, they must either all remain forever impassable, or their father himself must participate in passion. For the torch, which has been kindled subsequently, cannot be possessed of a different light from that which preceded it. Wherefore also their lights, when blended in one, return to the original identity since that one light is then formed which has existed even from the beginning. But we cannot speak with respect to light itself, of some part being more recent in its origin, and another being more ancient. For the whole is but one light. Nor can we so speak even regard to those torches which have received the light, for these are all contemporary as respects their material substance for the substance of torches is one and the same, but simply as to the time of its being kindled, since one was lighted a little while ago, and another has just now been kindled. 5. The defect, therefore, of that passion which has regard to ignorance, will either attach alike to their whole pleroma, since all its members are of the same substance, and the propator will share in this defect of ignorance, that is, will be ignorant of himself, or, on the other hand, all those lights which are within the pleroma will alike remain forever impassable. Whence, then, comes the passion of the youngest Ion, if the light of the Father is that from which all other lights have been formed, and which is by nature impassable? And how can one ion be spoken of as either younger or older among themselves, since there is but one light in the entire pleroma? And if any one calls them stars, they will all nevertheless appear to participate in the same nature. For if one star differs from another star in glory, but not in qualities nor substance, nor in the fact of being passable or impassable, so all these, since they are alike derived from the light of the Father, must either be naturally impassable or immutable, or they must all, in common with the light of the Father, be passable, and are capable of the varying phases of corruption. 6. The same conclusion will follow, although they affirm that the production of the ions sprang from Logos, as branches from a tree, since Logos has his generation from their father. For all the ions are formed of the same substance with the father, differing from one another only in size and not in nature, and filling up the greatness of the father, even as the fingers complete the hand. If, therefore, he exists in passion and ignorance, 
so must also those ions who have been generated by him. But if it is impious to ascribe ignorance and passion to the Father of all, how can they describe an ion produced by him as being passable? And while they ascribe the same impiety to the very wisdom or sophia of God, how can they still call themselves religious men? 7. If again they declare that their ions were sent forth just as rays are from the sun, then, since all are of the same substance and sprung from the same source, all must either be capable of passion along with him who produced them, or all will remain impassable for ever. For they can no longer maintain that, of beings so produced, some are impassable and others passable. If, then, they declare all impassable, they do themselves destroy their own argument. For how could the youngest Ion have suffered passion if all were impassable? If, on the other hand, they declare that all partook of this passion, as indeed some of them venture to maintain, then, inasmuch as it originated with Logos, but flowed on towards to Sophia, they will thus be convicted of tracing back the passion to Logos, who is the nous of this propator, and so acknowledging the nous of the propator and the father himself to have experienced passion. For the father of all is not to be regarded as a kind of compound being, who can be separated from his nous or mind, as I have already shown. But nous is the father, and the father nous. It necessarily follows, therefore, both that he who springs from him has Logos, or rather, that Nous himself, since he is Logos, must be perfect and impassable, and that those productions which proceed from him, seeing that they are of the same substance with himself, should be perfect and impassable, and should ever remain similar to him who produced them. 8. It cannot therefore longer be held, as these men teach, that Logos, as occupying the third place in generation, was ignorant of the Father. Such a thing might indeed perhaps be deemed probable in the case of the generation of human beings, inasmuch as these frequently know nothing of their parents. But it is altogether impossible in the case of the Logos of the Father. For if, existing in the Father, he knows him in whom he exists, that is, is not ignorant of himself, then those productions which issue from him, being his powers or faculties, and always present with him, will not be ignorant of him who emitted them, any more than rays may be supposed to be of the sun. It is impossible, therefore, that the Sophia of God, she who is within the Pleroma, inasmuch as she has been produced in such a manner, should have fallen under the influence of passion, and conceived of ignorance. But it is possible that that Sophia, who pertains to the scheme of Valentinus, inasmuch as she is a production of the devil, should fall into every kind of passion, and exhibit the profoundest ignorance. For when they themselves bear testimony concerning their mother, to the effect that she was the offspring of an erring Ion, we need no longer search for a reason why the sons of such a mother should be ever swimming in the depths of ignorance. 9. I am not aware that, besides these productions which have been mentioned, they are able to speak of any other. Indeed, they have not been known to me, although I have had very frequent discussions with them concerning forms of this kind, as ever setting forth any other peculiar kind of being as produced in the manner under consideration. This only they maintain, that each one of these was so produced as to know merely that one who produced him while he was ignorant of the one who immediately preceded. But they do not in this manner go forward in their account, 
with any kind of demonstration as to the manner in which these were produced, or how such a thing could take place among spiritual beings. For, in whatsoever they may choose to go forward, they will feel themselves bound, while, as regards the truth, they depart entirely from right reason, to proceed so far as to maintain that their word, who springs from the nous of the propator, to maintain, I say, that he was produced in a state of degeneracy. For they hold that perfect nous, previously begotten by the perfect bythus, was not capable of rendering that production, which issued from him perfect, but could only bring it forth utterly blind to the knowledge and greatness of the Father. They also maintain that the Saviour exhibited an emblem of this mystery in the case of that man who was blind from his birth, since the Ion was in this manner produced by monogenes blind, that is, in ignorance, thus falsely ascribing ignorance and blindness to the word of God, who, according to their own theory, holds the second place of production from the propator. Admirable sophists and explorers of the sublimities of the unknown father, and rehearsers of those super-celestial mysteries, which the angels desire to look into, that they may learn that, from the nous of that father who is above all, the word was produced blind, that is, ignorant of the father who produced him. 10. But, ye miserable sophists, how could the nous of the father, or rather the very father himself, since he is nous, and perfect in all things, have produced his own logos as an imperfect and blind ion, when he was able also to produce along with him the knowledge of the Father. As ye affirm that Christ was generated after the rest, and yet declare that he was produced perfect, much more, then, should Logos, who is anterior to him in age, be produced by the same nous, unquestionably perfect, and not blind? nor could he again have produced ions still blinder than himself, until at last your Sophia, always utterly blinded, gave birth to so vast a body of evils. And your father is the cause of all this mischief, for ye declare the magnitude and power of your father to be the causes of ignorance, assimilating him to Bythus, and assigning this as a name to him who is the unnameable father. But if ignorance is an evil, and ye declare all evils to have derived their strength from it, while ye maintain that the greatness and power of the father is the cause of this ignorance, ye do thus set him forth as the author of all evils. For ye state as the cause of evil this fact, that no one could contemplate his greatness. But if it was really impossible for the Father to make himself known from the beginning of those beings that were formed by him, he must in that case be held free from blame, inasmuch as he could not remove the ignorance of those who came after him. But if, at a subsequent period, when he so willed it, he could take away that ignorance which had increased with the successive productions as they followed each other, and thus became deeply seated in the ions. Much more had he so willed it, might he formerly have prevented that ignorance, which as yet was not from coming into existence. 11. Since, therefore, as soon as he so pleased, he did become known not only to the ions, but also to these men who lived in these latter times. But, as he did not so please to be known from the beginning, he remained unknown, the cause of ignorance, according to you, the will of the Father. For if he foreknew that these things would in future happen in such a manner, why then did he not guard against the ignorance of these beings before it had obtained a place among them, rather than afterwards, as if under the influence of repentance, 
deal with it through the production of Christ. For the knowledge which through Christ he conveyed to all, he might long before have imparted through Logos, who was also the first begotten of Monogenes. Or, if knowing them beforehand, he willed that these things should happen, as they have done, then the works of ignorance must endure for ever and never pass away. For the things which have been made in accordance with the will of your propator must continue along with the will of him who willed them, or, if they pass away, the will of him also who decreed that they should have a being will pass away along with them. And why did the Ions find rest and attain perfect knowledge through learning, at last, that the Father is altogether incomprehensible? They might surely have possessed this knowledge before they became involved in passion. For the greatness of the Father did not suffer diminution from the beginning, so that these might know that he was altogether incomprehensible? For if, on account of his infinite greatness, he remained unknown, he ought also, on account of his infinite love, to have preserved those impassable who were produced by him, since nothing hindered, and expediency rather required, that they should have known from the beginning that the Father was altogether incomprehensible. End of Book 2, Chapters 16-17